snake, like like an actual snake that like lived in his apartment. And I was like, we were doing a project. <laughs> and I was like, I like dropped my pencil and it rolled under the couch. And I look, there's just a fucking huge boa constrictor. <laughs> and I was like, you should warn people that you live <laughs> with a giant boa constrictor <laughs> before they just run into it. So anyway, uh, fortunately, I'm not afraid of snakes. So let's talk about using work to change speed. And this is something we've basically already talked about, right? What happens if you have force? Right, work has to do with force. What's changing speed mean in physics? Acceleration, acceleration right? So you apply a force, you get an acceleration. Remember, work is just force and displacement. So in this case, if you have a force, you have a displacement, you, that means your speed is changing because naturally you're going to have an acceleration, okay? So let's start with a speed, let's call it V initial. All right, and then we have a force. We'll call this force external. It's the external force, okay? Which means what about our system? What is our system in this case? So what, like, what objects are included in the system? Probably just the block, right? You could probably include the floor too. Uh, I don't, it, that would still be an external force, but something outside of the block is pushing the block and it's not the floor. Okay, so that's the external force. Then at some later time, right, this thing speeds up and you're in a new position, so that's your displacement, right? And then you have a bigger speed, because obviously you've been applying this constant external force, that means there's an acceleration. But from the perspective of work, okay, remember this is our definition of work. This is the full definition of work, which is an integral with a dot product. I know it looks ugly, but just remember, integral means the force is variable, dot product just measures the parallelness of this thing, okay? And we're going, if we want to write it in this specific case, and sorry, this is, this is a derivation. You don't have to memorize this. I'm just going to walk you through it. This is our external force, dx. Okay, the, where did the dot product go? It became dx because cosine is zero. Cosine, cosine, is, cosine of zero is one, so the dot product goes away. Okay, so now you just have this dx. Remember, force is equal to mass times acceleration, so we just sub in mass times acceleration here. Okay, now we're going to do some fancy things with chain rule. See, chain rule, so useful. Okay, so we can call acceleration dv dt. Everybody comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. All right, we also have dx. Now we're going to use chain rule. So this is our chain rule. So do we call this dv dx dx dt? That's the same thing as dv dt. Yes? Does that look familiar? Calculus things? All right. So now we have this. Um, and then we do a thing that they don't totally love in, um, in math. And we, we just cancel some dx's. Okay. And then we save the dv. And then what is dx dt? V. Okay, so we end up with mv dv. Hey, we could do that integral, right? That's just like x dx. So uh, what does that give us? If you just have an integral of v dv. V squared, v squared over 2, right? We're getting very good at that integral. Like I said, you take this whole class on calculus, we only have to know how to do like three or four integrals in this class, okay? Um, so we get one half... Oh, I, I, I write chain rule happens. And, and you don't have to know this to get here. I'm just showing you how we're relating these two things, okay? Um, we end up with something that looks like this. So we just plug in our limits of integration. Oh, that's what they're called. Uh, one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared, all right? Um, it turns out that kinetic energy, and we talked about this a little bit for the lab, is just one half mv squared. Okay, and kinetic energy is just any energy of motion. So, for instance, let me use this guy. Make sure it's close, right? If I throw this thing in the air, while it's going up, it has kinetic energy, right? It starts out with a lot of it, it decreases, it's turning into potential energy. Potential energy is stored energy based on position. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit in the lab, but up here, it has a, a potential energy of like mg delta y. So whatever height I've brought it to. Then as it starts to fall again, it turns back into kinetic energy. Okay, And conservation of energy says as long as no energy enters or leaves the system, from the point where it leaves my hand to the point where it comes back to my hand, 
the total energy of the system should be the same. Now, the energy of the system comes from me putting energy into the system by applying an external force. Yes? So you said that energy never leaves. In that moment where it's like perfectly nothing, what happens to all that energy? Does it just pause? No, so the, it, it transfers types of energy, okay? So while this thing's going up, so right after I let go of it, so while I'm touching it, there's external energy coming in from me. That would be that would be an external force which would give you an external work. So let's say I give it three joules of energy, okay? At this point when it starts moving away from my hand, it has three joules of kinetic energy which would be described as one half mv squared. So if you know it has three joules and you know its mass, you could calculate its speed, okay? As it slows down and goes up, that means some of that kinetic energy, the kinetic energy is getting smaller until it's zero up here. Okay, that kinetic energy is being transferred into potential energy. So let's say right here I have three joules of kinetic energy, whereas here I probably have two joules of kinetic energy and one joule of potential energy. So you could, in a way, say it's stored. Yeah, it's no, potential energy is stored energy. So I take this motion energy and I store it as positional energy. That's potential energy. Okay, same thing with springs, right? As you, as you do work on the spring, you stretch the spring, it stores energy in the position of the spring, okay? And that's, that's why, like, <laughs> that's why there's, like, a, an inherent dangerousness in having a, a compressed or stretched spring or standing at the edge of a high place, right? Because you have all this stored energy that you could change into kinetic energy, which is, like, acceleration, right? So just standing... Like, if, you, if I'm standing here, my potential energy is zero. But if I stand up here, right, my potential energy is not zero. So the ability for me to transfer that into kinetic energy is there, okay? If I'm down here, I don't have stored potential energy because there's nowhere for me to go. I mean, I guess I could go jump off that balcony, but um, I'm not going to demonstrate that. But <laughs> I do also have potential energy there. So... Um, you know, most, most good sports have some form of, like, transfer of potential and kinetic energy. Um, I used to pole vault. That's a big transfer of kinetic energy into potential energy and then back into kinetic energy, right? And if you, and also, like, the, the technology of the pole, that has, that's basically a big spring. So there's, a, there's an, another part where you're storing it into like in the actual pole to transition from like kinetic to potential energy. So how high you go really depends on your pole. It's like spring constant and how fast you can run to the point where you take off. And then the rest of it's like technique and center of mass stuff. But it's, it's terrifying. It was very scary every time I did it. Um, I thought it would get easier, but no, then you just get better and you go higher and it's just as scary. So uh, but I enjoy being scared, apparently. Um, so kinetic energy is the energy of motion. This is kinetic energy. This is an equation you want to remember. You don't have to remember how to derive it. Like, it's good that you know that you can derive it. But this is an equation that you want to remember. So anytime we talk about kinetic energy, you should think 1 half mv squared. Now, what's really nice about this v being squared, this is now speed, not velocity. What's nice about speed versus velocity? It's not a vector. It is not a vector, so it doesn't freaking matter which way it's pointing, okay? Uh, that can be good and bad. It means we're losing some information because the directional information is an extra piece of information that we've been having when we're dealing with vectors, but it's also hard to keep track of. So here's a little um, quick clicker question just to sort of test out kinetic energy. Right, we are mostly thinking C, but there's some A's and B's out there. Please discuss, we'll vote again. <laughs> ah, C, yes. So the answer is C, um, but, but how do we figure this out? Well, we're really just looking at the speed because we know all these balls are the same ball. They have the same mass, so we don't have to worry about that. The other thing is one half. So this is the largest speed, right? At the peak is the smallest speed. But what's interesting is B and D have to be the same. Why are they the same? Same size area. Yeah, they have the same size speed. And we know if this is 
you know, a trajectory that's an arc. If they're in the same position and it's starting and ending at the same place, they should have the same speed. That's how there's a symmetry to the projectile motion that makes that true. But also if you just eyeball these vectors, they look about the same. So B and, and D should be the same kinetic energy. They should be the same speed, even though they're different directions, because remember it's squared. So we care about speed and not velocity. Okay, cool. So this brings us to work kinetic energy theorem. Um, so this says, this is, it's, this is the complicated definition. It says when work's done on a system, the only change in the system is its speed, then the net work done on the system is the change in kinetic energy of the system. That's just a fancy way of saying, if I put a certain amount of energy into this system, and it's just, and we're just measuring it as kinetic energy, then the difference between the beginning kinetic energy and the final kinetic energy is going to give you the work I put in. It's really just a conservation of energy statement, um, but we're using it to sort of bring ourselves into conservation of energy from the force direction. Okay, so we're talking about work. And so external work, like I said, if you have, this thing's not heavy enough now, um, if you have something that you're throwing or pushing, right? That means that you're putting energy into the system where the system is this object and then you're providing an external force and therefore external work, okay? That means the total amount of energy in the system is provided by the external force, okay? So like I was saying, if I throw this thing and I give it three joules, right, from the time that I've grab it to the time that it leaves my hand, if there's three joules of energy, then at each point, there's three joules of energy, whether it's distributed as kinetic or potential energy. So if, if I'm going, but, but more specifically for work kinetic energy theorem, we're talking about the time that I'm actually applying the external force, okay? So from here to here, if I apply three joules of force, that means I will have a speed, let's say it starts at a speed of zero, it'll have a final speed that's equal to one half mv squared, and it will be also be equal to the amount of work I put in. Because basically I'm taking it from zero kinetic energy to the same amount of kinetic energy as I have work. Okay, so if this bottle is the system, external force is the only thing adding the, the work. We're dealing only with kinetic energy. Once it leaves my hand, we no longer have an external work, right? But we still maintain the same amount of energy. So that's the conservation of energy piece, conservation of mechanical energy that we'll talk about in the next chapter. Okay. So really, we're just coming up with definitions, right? I'm, a, I'm putting energy into the system by creating an external force. We can measure how much external force I put in by measuring the change in speed. Okay? Same, it's pretty much the same thing as we were doing before. If you wanted to do that as a kinematics equation, you could measure the change in speed, find out the force, and have pretty much the same answer. So this is just a, an energy-based approach to the same sort of stuff we've been doing in the previous chapters. But this is now called work kinetic energy theorem, and we can use it to solve problems. We're, we have a model rocket, which this is actually something we're going to do later. Uh, we're going to start, I think maybe even this week, planning out our, our rocket lab. So at the end of the semester, we, we get to ra launch some rockets over at Fiesta Island, and um, it's pretty fun. So I think we'll, we'll start that lab this week. I'll post it shortly because we're a little behind on the other lab, and I don't want you guys to have to do something that we haven't done for another week. Um, so the first one is just a simulation. It should be pretty good. Anyway, a 1.5 kilogram model rocket is launched straight up from rest. The thrust from the rocket engine is 40 newtons. Um, and we want to know what's the speed of the rocket when it's 50 meters above the ground. And we know this is a work kinetic energy theorem problem. So this is the equation we're going to use. Rem reminding ourselves that kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared and that work is defined as this integral of f dot dr. Okay, so these are our equations that we need. Um, we're going to start with the model rocket. So let's say, here's the ground. So the rocket starts on the ground. Um, I'm going to have it look like this. And then at some later point, it's, it's at uh, 50 meters above the ground. So, let's see. Let's 
make a, an x-axis here. A y-axis. Okay, so there's our rocket. Um, what are the forces on this rocket? We'll draw one in between. So we have the thrust, right? Let me just have multiple stages of this rocket. So let's, we have the thrust. MG. And we have MG, which is probably smaller than the thrust. Okay. So when we figure out our net force, if we sum up all our forces in the y direction, like we're we were doing in the previous chapter, we get F, I'm going to just call that F sub T minus MG. Okay. In this case, we aren't going to necessarily write mass times acceleration because we're not using the kinematics problem. We just want to know the net force. So what we're going to do, let's, let's just call this net force because we want net work, right? And this is in the y direction. So that's going to be 40 newtons minus 1.5 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. That's going to give us a net force of 25.3 newtons. Okay, that's just our force. What we need is this work kinetic energy theorem. So I'm going to move this over. I'm just going to save this for later. So looking at work kinetic energy theorem, um, how do we calculate the work? So that's going to be the, this is the net work, right? So that's going to be F net times uh, delta Y. Okay, what do we know about the change in kinetic energy? So it's, it's going to be final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy, right? Final kinetic energy is one half m v squared minus what's our initial velocity? Zero. Zero. So one half zero squared, which is zero. Okay. So we end up with one half m v squared minus zero. Okay. Um, what are we solving for? Yeah, we want to know, what is the speed, right? So we want to know speed of the rocket when it's 50 meters above the ground. So that means our delta Y should be what? Yeah, so delta Y, in this case, goes this way. That's delta Y, that's going to be 50 meters. So we're going to solve this for V. So that's going to be uh, V is equal to 2 net force delta y uh, divided by the mass square root, just some algebra, okay? So we plug in our numbers. That's going to be 2 times 25.3 newtons. That's our net force times 50 meters divided by uh, 1.5 kilograms. When we plug all that in, we should get 41.1 .1 meters per second. So that means we've gone from 0 to 41.1 .1 meters per second just, just from the, the work, the external work put in by the explosion. Okay? So just to review, it's, it's sort of straightforward. This is the equation we need, but it includes these two other things, right? You have to know what work is and you have to know what kinetic energy is. So you start from this equation, but you plug in your values for work. And remember, work is, is sort of complicated because you have to decide, do you need to integrate? Is it a constant force? Is What's the displacement? Are they parallel or are at an angle? Okay. And then for the kinetic energy, that's a little bit simpler. You just need to know the initial and final speed. All right. Cool. Let's try another one of these.
And you can see these are a little bit more straightforward than some of our more, like some of the force problems we were doing in the last couple weeks. Um, so in this case, we have a thousand kilogram car traveling at 20 meters per second. It slams on its brakes and skids to a halt, okay? We have a coefficient of kinetic friction between the tire and the ground. We wanna know how far does the car skid, okay? So we're gonna draw this out. And this is in the X direction. So we have a car. I'm going to draw a terrible picture of a car. Um, we have two cars, actually. It's the same car, but I'm going to bring it over here. Oops. So at this point, it has a speed of, we'll call that V initial, of 20 meters per second. At this point, it has a speed of zero, okay? Um, what else do we know about this car? What else are we concerned about? It's weight. It's mass. weight. Uh, where does that come in? Uh, <clears throat> when you're talking about like gravity? Yeah, so we have a normal force, right? So we're still doing this. We have gravity. Um, what other force are we worried about? Friction. Friction. And friction points this way, right? So this is kinetic friction, which we know is mu n. Okay? We also need to know the displacement, right? Because this is a work problem. So we know this thing goes from here to here. And we'll call this delta x. And this is what we're looking for, right? Because it's asking how far does the car skid, okay? So um, we also know that, just, just as a side note, uh, the, con the coefficient of friction is gonna be 0 0.8. So what's our force here that we use for work? Friction. Friction, okay? So let's start, once again, with our work kinetic energy theorem. So this is work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Okay. In this case, when we talk about work, that needs to be the, the work from kinetic friction. So we'll, over to the side, we'll talk about kinetic friction. So kinetic friction is mu k times normal force, right? In this case, we have normal force is equal to mg. Just This is sort of the fast version of what we were doing with our force diagrams, but because we know these are in the y direction, um, and there's no acceleration in the y direction, we know they should be equal. So that means force of friction is mu k mg, all right? Um, just as a side note, just for practice, should this work be positive or negative? Negative. Negative, why? Because uh, it's moving, the force is moving in the opposite direction of the... Yeah, the force is in, in the opposite direction as the displacement. Okay. Um, so if we want to figure out the kinetic friction, we plug in uh, these things. We don't, we can, let's get an actual value. So we get um, 0 0.8 times 1,000 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. That should give us 7,840 newtons of friction. Okay, so that's our kinetic friction. All right, when we look at our work, how do we define that? So one, we know that they're both in the x direction, right? Force and displacement. So we can say, okay, we have kinetic friction times our displacement, which is delta x. That's the thing we're trying to find. That's gonna be our work. That should be equal to our change in kinetic energy. Our change in kinetic energy is going to be zero, right? one half mv squared over here is gonna be zero, minus one half mass uh, v initial squared, okay? And we know v initial, um, the other thing is we know this should be negative, right? So we know that these negatives are gonna cancel. We know that our, our um, displacement is gonna be positive, so hopefully, even if you make a sign error, you can still sort that out. Um, the, so we solve this for what? Which thing do we want to find? Delta x. Delta x. Okay. 
So we end up with delta x is equal to 1 half mv initial squared divided by kinetic friction. So you can plug this in, 1 half 1,000 kilograms. Uh, we have 20 meters per second squared, and that's divided by 7,840 newtons. You can also just plug this in here if it's easier for you. That's also perfectly acceptable. I just did this on the side because it's similar to what we were doing before. Um, so you plug all these numbers in, and that gives you a distance of 25.5 meters. Okay, so our delta x is 25.5 meters. And then, you know, as we do when there's things that we can't actually think about this way, does this make sense? So just looking into, remember, 20 meters per second, that's like 40, 45 miles an hour. So if you're going 45 miles an hour and you slam on the brakes, this is about... 25 and a half meters, 28 yards, if that's more comfortable. Does that make sense? Yeah, seems reasonable, right? Okay, any questions about this? So once again, we start with the work kinetic energy theorem, right? We have to know what the work is, so that's force times distance, unless we have angles or variable forces, which in this case, luckily, we don't. What do we know about kinetic friction? Is that a constant force or a variable force? Constant. Constant force, right? Just depends on normal force and the friction force. And then change in kinetic energy is always just one-half mv squared, final minus initial. Okay? Okay. So we can also find out how long it took it to slow down, right? To get... To that so that would require seconds. that would require going back to kinematics, right? Okay. So you would you could you do have enough information to do that because we have the force, which means we can have the acceleration. But that would be going back to what we were doing in the previous chapters. But it's still totally doable. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's either B, C, or D. Please discuss. We'll vote again. D over here. Oh. Better. Okay. So, remember, work kinetic energy theorem. What is this two joules? What kind of energy is that? Yeah, kinetic energy. Okay. <laughs> Good try. Um, here, let me just write this out. So the, the answer is C, but let me just let me just write this out for for us. So just look writing out work kinetic energy theorem. That's gonna be work is equal to the change. Oh my gosh, what a terrible job there. It's equal to the change in kinetic energy. Okay. So we have um, we want to know the kinetic energy final, right? So that means we can rewrite this as work is equal to kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. So that means kinetic energy final is equal to work plus kinetic energy initial, okay? What's the kinetic energy initial? Two. Two. What's the work? Four. Four. How do we get the work? Area under the curve. Yeah, you just take the area under the curve. So the area of this triangle, nice if I could color better. The area of this triangle is one half base times height, one half two times four is four joules, okay? So really we're just adding four joules plus two joules, which gives us six joules. Okay, here. So we have another question. So we have a toy car and a real car. They're both starting at rest. We push them with the same force for the same distance. How do the kinetic energies compare? Mostly thinking C. Please discuss. We'll vote again. <laughs> Okay, back to C. The answer is C, um, but why is the answer C? C is always the answer. <laughs> C is always the answer. So what do we know about the work? It's changing Well, so do the cars have the same or different work? Different. No, same. same. Should be the same work, right? They have... This, it's the same car, right? It doesn't depend on the mass. It's just going to be the force, whatever uh, the equal force used to push the cars, okay, uh, times the displacement, which is the same. So force the same, displacement the same, the work should be the same. 
However, what's very different about the cars? The, the, mass. the mass. Mass, right? Also the weight, but the mass is the important part here. So the one with the really small mass is going to have a much bigger V because the change in kinetic energy, and they both start from zero, has to be the same. Okay, so the final kinetic energy is one half mv squared. If you make the m small, the v has to be much bigger to get the same value. Okay.